What is up and welcome into the block. I've got my guys, Carl Reed, Blake Brockemeyer. I am Colin Kennedy here live from Big 12 Media Days. We gave you the preview yesterday, but it's time to get in a little bit more in depth to everything going on in the world of college football. Gentlemen, where do I want to start, by the way? I want to start with a guy in Mike Gundy who will be coming up at 12.35 p.m. Central Time here at AT AT&T Stadium. He'll have a lot to talk about, but I do want to reminisce on one of the greatest rants in the history of college football. If you want to go after an athlete, one of my athletes, you go after one that doesn't do the right thing. You don't downgrade him because he does everything right and may not play as well on Saturday, and you let us make that decision. That's why I don't read the newspaper, because it's garbage. And the editor that let it come out is garbage, attacking an amateur athlete for doing everything right. And then you want to write articles about guys that don't do things right and downgrade them, the ones that do make plays. Are you kidding me? Where are we at in society today? Come after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. I'm not, a, I'm not a kid. Write something about me or our coaches. Don't write about a kid that does everything right, that's hearts broken. If you want to go after an so athlete. So first of all, you guys need to come athletes. after us, like, share, subscribe you go after- to the brand new YouTube channel and us here on the block. But gentlemen, I love it. Every time I watch it, I laugh. But I, I do think this is somewhat of an illumination as to the new era of college football and what we're dealing with in media today. Back then, you had to kind of be politically correct in terms of how you handled a poor performance from a player or a bad moment in game. But now in the era of NIL and collectives and the transfer portal, Carl, I don't know, it just feels like there's a changing of the times when we talk about how these players should be perceived in the general public. Well, Mike, they ain't amateurs no more. I can tell you that. (laughs) They're grown men now. They're not amateurs. And they got to be able to take the heat now. They driving around in Cadillac Escalades. They getting $10,000 a month. Some of them have million dollar NIL deals. They got to be able to take the heat. They are professionals now. Whether people like that or not, that's where the game is today. In 2007, when he said it, it was a great point. It was a great time. And it was the right thing to do. Uh, But it hasn't aged well for where the game is today. You got to be able to put your big boy pants on. If you want it, if you want the star rankings, you want the NIL money, you want the red carpet treatment with recruiting, you want to drive around in the Cadillac, you want the prettiest girl on campus, you want the most followers on Instagram, then hey, you better make sure you block that three technique, big dog, on Saturday, or we on top of you. <laughs> yeah, Carl Carl hit the hit hit the nail on the head on this one. It's a uh... I, I would I would love to give kids the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I mean, they're basically at the highest levels of college football. They're basically pros, and a lot of these guys are making a lot of money. And so I think with with the money become becomes more scrutiny because, like Carl said, I mean they're basically professionals. Even at, some of them are 18 years old, 19 years old. They're still kids, but uh, it's a different spotlight. It's a different era. Social media really comes after these guys. If you go on, uh, you know, any, anything, I mean, people are relentless on social media. So uh, it's, it's a different era now, but uh, I think you, I still try to give kids the benefit of the doubt, you know, privately, I might say things different than publicly about certain players, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, these kids are trying their hardest. They don't want to fail. They want to do their best and they're under a lot of pressure uh, to perform, but uh, if they're making a lot of money, it's a little bit different now. Well, Blake, one of the things that I say, I, I beg to differ a little bit. I don't think they under a ton of pressure. It's guys that are getting paid $10 an hour to park cars outside of the AT&T Stadium, Jerry's World, where Colin is at right now. And if those guys miss one day of work, they're not going to be able to pay their rent. Those guys are under pressure. These guys are living in luxury. They're making money. They're playing a, a kid's game for a, for a profit. It's no pressure there. Go out there and perform. Coaches are getting paid tens of millions of dollars. 
We got players making millions of dollars right now, several making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Go out there and do your job. If you don't do it well, somebody's going to have something to say about you. But, man, you better suck it up, buttercup. And if your feelings get hurt, come see me. i give you a big old hug. <laughs> yeah, it's it, 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 but you got to remember, Carl, that not every single guy is making hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. I mean, there, there are certain levels. I mean, obviously, these big time quarterbacks are, are, are making huge money and all the big time players are. But at the end of the day, no matter what these kids say, they are trying to get to the league. And, and there's a there's a certain amount of pressure that comes with that. So, uh, I mean, if it, if it doesn't work out, which most likely it's not going to. I mean, the odds of making it to the league are, are slim. But uh, but there is pressure with that. It's a different kind of pressure than than what you just mentioned. But uh, I think it just depends on, you know, how these kids are built and, and what their their future goals are. And if these guys are playing big time college football, you know, they're about making it to the league. And, that, and that's what it's all about. So going off of this, guys, I want to go back to a tweet that we talked about here on this show a while back. And in relation to pressure or a lack thereof, Caleb Williams once discussed the fact that he didn't want attention. He didn't want to be in the national spotlight. But we're also talking about a quarterback on the West Coast who's probably going to make a ton of money and will routinely be in the national spotlight and talked about. Carl, do we just think a lot of these kids don't genuinely know whether there is pressure or not. Is there some educating to do here when we talk about these players and the new landscape that they fit into? Put on your Beach by Dre headphones and ignore the noise. You know, <laughs> turn up the sound in your Cadillac. You know, you, you can't be the quarterback at USC and nobody say anything about you or the quarterback at Oklahoma. It just is what he's going to be a first round draft pick eventually. Nobody's going to get criticized more than the quarterback. It, it's just the way that the game is. But these players, they court the attention when it's convenient for them. How many kids have you seen, hey, if I get up to 10,000 followers in the next hour, I'll drop my top five. Hey, I got an offer from so-and-so, even though I committed to this other school just yesterday. I need some more followers. Help me out. You know, you court the attention and then, when you don't, when something is said you don't like, it hurts your feelings a little bit and it bothers you and you really can't have it both ways. Yeah, if you don't want the attention, don't go to USC and enter the transfer portal after starting at Oklahoma your freshman year. Go to Blend Junior College in Texas and, and see how that works out for you. So you, you don't want the spotlight. You got to go to a smaller school. You got to keep your head down. But, but you know, he's out there. Uh, you know, in the portal, you know, trying to get a nice offer, NIL money, and, and getting a great situation, which good for, good for him. That's the rules that you, that, that you can play by now, and, I, and I, I have nothing wrong with that. But you go to USC as a quarterback, you think of all the, the lineage of great quarterbacks that USC has, and, and you're expected to be the next guy. You're going to be talked about as much as the NFL quarterbacks are, and that's just the way it is, especially in L.A., so – uh, you know, if you don't want to hear, you don't want to hear the noise, get off of social media, get off of Instagram, you know, don't, don't keep up with it. Keep your head down, go in the film room, be with your teammates 24 hours a day and, and study football. But that, that's just the way it is now. I mean, you're a big time program. You're going to, you're going to have a lot of scrutiny and a lot of notoriety, which can be good and bad. I think there's still a lot to learn for these players as they learn how to address the attention that they draw. But going from players to coaches, I think all of us on this show love this moment in the history of sports, but I want to now go to the greatest college baseball coach of all time, in my mind, a one argue Garrido. How can we get picked off at first base? How can you do that? The that about what do you think you're with here this isn't about some game this is about our lives don't you get it don't you get it you don't have a choice when i tell you to take you take don't tell me you don't see it you look you understand i don't give a like i said 15 minutes from now, you don't give a f You'll walk out of here. I gotta live with this mother f 
embarrassing game the rest of my life. I have totally failed you guys. We got beat at every single part of this. Everything. Everything. Infield play. They two out hitting. Everything. Totally stupid. I'm sorry. I apologize. I have totally let you down. Ooh, okay, first of all, shout out to our producer, Zach Bennett, for hitting the bleep button a couple of different times, to say the least. But going from that, I've got an interesting perspective on this because I've got a head coach of 20-plus years. I've got a former college coach who also played at the University of Texas where Augie Garrido coached at. I think there's some unique discussion to have here. We talk about all this attention. We talk about the changing landscape. I want to talk about the attention to detail coaches must now apply when talking to their players. So, Carl, do you think that coaches can talk like that anymore in today's day and age with everything that's going on? Or should we still imply some of these tactics that we saw the great Augie Garrido share in his locker room, if you will? I think they should be able to talk to kids like this still that play at places like the University of Texas. I think it's frowned upon in the days of society. We've become very to, But you think about it, you want to be recruited at the highest level. You want to be given the nicest things. You want the nicest rooms on campus. You want to have your own training table. You want to be able to drive nice cars. You want the nicest gear. But you don't want anybody to talk to you harshly when you got to be corrected. There's sometimes not a nice way to tell a guy that he's doing a bad job. Sometimes you have to be very direct with it. And it's a lot of money on the line. It's a lot of things at stake. And um, you better get used to people saying things to you that make you uncomfortable when you're not doing your job well. That Texas team that Augie was talking to went on to win 10 games in a row and won the conference championship. It really woke them up. But if you're playing baseball at a place like the University of Texas, or you're playing football at one of these top schools, um, you should be demanded at a very high level to perform up to the expectations that they have of you. I think it's changed a lot, kind of like, kind of like what Carl was saying earlier. Uh, you know, the old school days, kind of where I grew up in, that was normal. I mean, coaches cussed you out, yelled at you. I mean, they could get away with that. With, uh, and, and, you know, today's current landscape with transfer portal, and Generation Z kids, it's a different deal. I mean, kid, you can't talk to kids the way that you once did. Some of them you can. I mean, some of them want that. I mean, a lot of kids, like my kids love that. Like that, they're used to that. So, but they've grown up with that. So I think it's it, it's different uh, at, you know, everywhere you go, I think it's trending away from the yelling and screaming. You, you realize you don't have to do that to connect to kids. Connect, kids connect differently to coaches. They're, they're the way that they're coached. You know, some kids need to be yelled at and some kids, you know, respond poorly when you yell at them. So I think you got to know your kids. You got to know you, your culture. The, at the end of the day, these coaches are making millions and millions of dollars. And so they are there to win. And so whatever it takes for them to win, for them to get another year on their contract, like they are going to do that. So if a coach feels like they need to do it, then then they will. And, and, and you know, you just got to know your audience. You got to know your kids that you're coaching. And it's just a, a different era as, as we evolve. Blake, I think that you hit it on the head. I mean, we will coach much differently. My college coach said things to me that if they were heard today, um, it would be an uproar, you know, throughout social media and everything. But I love them for it. And I love him for what he did for me. And I think that it helped make a man out of me. My father was very tough on me the same way. And I think that that's needed and that's missing. Now they have a phrase, they call it toxic masculinity. And if I tell somebody that I enjoyed being coached like that, they'd probably tell you that somebody mentally damaged me somewhere along the way. But I think that I'm, I think that I'm okay, you know? And so I think that you need tough love sometimes 
I think that you have to really tell, especially with young men, you have to really, really sometimes go at them really hard to get them to do the things that they're supposed to do. And I don't think that coaches like that are doing anything other than making guys rise to the occasion for the expectations that they have. Because one day you're going to have some real responsibilities. And if you don't have your things in order, it's not going to, you're not going to like the way people treat you then either. Yeah. I think as a man, most of these kids would say later in life that some of the things that they endured and went through were, 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 were great experiences for uh, their life experiences that, that they're experiencing now. I think that, you know, that you don't realize it at the time, but as you get older, you look back on things and you realize that that actually made me a better person, a better human being. And, and at the end of the day, I think most of these coaches really want that for their kids. I think, you know, they want to win, but they also want their, their kids to, to be able to be men when they enter the real world, because football is not forever. It's a short part of your life. You know, very few make it to the next level, even though everybody thinks they will. And, you know, you got to be a, a positive influence for society and as a, and as a, a human being at, at the end of the day. And so that's, uh, you know, the most important lesson that these coaches can, can instill on these kids. And if I was talking to a kid today that was playing football or any sport, my advice to him would be, if somebody cusses you out and gets right in your face, it's probably because they see some potential in it. Hold off on calling and telling your mom to call for you. Hold off on calling your dad and crying to him. All right. Take the coaching, suck it up, and try to improve on what they're telling you to improve on. Yeah. Uh, one of my kids told me that he wished the coaches would cuss him out more. He, he loves to be yelled at and cussed at. And he told me one time, he goes, yeah, I wish they would yell at me more and, and, and degrade me more. I'm like, man, I must have done a number on you. I called my mom one day and told her my coach was yelling at me and she told me I was being the softest puppy piss, you know, so it's a different, it's a different time, different era. I, I don't know what's going on in the Brockermeyer household or obviously the, the path that coach Reed was brought up upon, but let me tell you something. I am firm and secure as I get coaching from both of these gentlemen on my sides. All right. So let's talk about real quick. Cause you guys did a really good job of addressing all the angles I wanted to talk about there. Let's talk about what's maybe creating kind of this disconnect between players and coaches. And Carl, you are not only a coach, but you brought an awesome element to the show in terms of learning a lot more about NIL and its collectives across the country. What's the issue here? What are some problems that you're hearing about this new wave in college football? Guys aren't getting paid. They're not getting the money that they've been promised. And in a lot of cases, they don't have adequate representation. So they're not able to defend themselves. But a lot of these guys are going in the rooms with head coaches and coaching staffs. They're being told by these collectives that they're going to get a certain amount of money. And then that doesn't happen. And then they don't have any recourse. Because the big thing about it is once they transfer, they can't transfer again. So now you're stuck. And you got a major decision that you have to make on how you're going to handle that. Me personally, if you promised me $50,000, $100,000, and then you reneged that you didn't pay on it, I wouldn't play until you resolved the issue. I, I would hold out like they do in the pros because you're using this money to entice it. There were kids who passed up on football situations and academic situations that were better than them because they were promised money money that they have not received. And so now So with all that into consideration, Blake, we know that there are promises not being filled. There's an individual out there by the name of Jordan Addison, who we know had some NIL deals float around his name. Now, there are rumors that that has not been delivered upon once he arrived at USC. So if you're him, Blake, as a player, do you do what Carl Reed is saying and try and hold out, maybe take a different angle here, or are you just going to the office and trying to fix the situation best you can as you prepare for the 2022 season? 
Well, I have no idea if that's true or not. I mean, that's something that I've read as well, but you don't know if that's actually true. But if it is true, and I were Jordan Addison, I wouldn't play a down this year. He didn't even need to. I mean, he's going to be a top pick whether he plays or not. And so uh, I wouldn't play until they until they delivered on what they promised to me. I have no idea what it was that he was promised. But whether it's $10 or $10,000, I'm, I'm going to make sure if, if that was part of the deal that I, that I get it. And so – I wouldn't play, I did, just like what Carl said, I wouldn't play, I wouldn't practice, I'd go do my own thing. And then once I got, once they, you know, paid me or, or compensated me on what we agreed on, then I'd be back. But I mean, for that to happen, that can ruin your, your, your locker room one. And it can also ruin the reputation of the school that you're at. Because if you're promising things and you're not delivering, then kids aren't going to want to go there. So again, I don't know if that's true or not, but if it, if, if that, hypothetically, if that were true, that's how I would resolve it. But if you're not an elite player, you can't do that. You got to go play because at the end of the day, you got to, you know, you're there to, to, to be the best version of yourself and try to make it to the league. So uh, it's, it's, it's a tough situation, but he's in a great spot because he's going to get his regardless. I don't care whether or not you're dealing with a collective or whether you're dealing with a company outside of marketing, get proper representation, get an agent, get a lawyer, and make sure everything is in writing because documentation always beats conversation. I think that's an excellent way to put it, Carl. And so I hope that we will see more on this situation come out. But for now, rumors swirling, not only about Jordan Addison, but players in general, as we try and learn more about this NIL era. Okay, I want to close with this, guys. We love these film studies here on the block. Peter Skaronsky at Northwestern is drawing a ton of first-round conversation as maybe the Wildcats' next first-round offensive lineman. But, Blake, when you turn on the tape, especially as a former offensive lineman, what stood out to you? Well, he's a, a an interesting prospect because he took over for, for Rashawn Slater when he opted out of the 2020 season – for COVID and started his freshman year, was second team all Big Ten his freshman year, first team all Big Ten last year. He's an excellent prospect. He's a very fluid athlete that really does a great job of unlocking his hips and hands at the point. I really like how he keeps a wide base and is fluid and everything that he does. Uh, he, he's a very good pass protector in space. He's got a few little technical flaws that I think he can work on to really improve his technique but I watched him against the against four NFL uh, first or second round picks this year and and he more than held his own and I expect a big season out of him I think uh, you know Northwestern it would help if they could get a little bit of a lead where he can you know mix in the run and pass blocking but but he's good at both his film was good uh, so I, I think he's an excellent prospect to keep an eye on I think he's you know, in my mind, a first round pick right now. Uh, and just depending on how he can improve this year is how, how far up the draft he can move. I definitely agree with you, Blake. This is a first round guy all the way. And like you said, he stepped in for Slater and you forgot that Slater wasn't playing, you know? And so he has the ability to block in space. He has, he has great hands, the way he uses it, extends his arm, uses his feet and pass pro. Um, he Northwestern always has a guy or two that plays their way into the first round. They have a great developmental program for the guys they bring in, and he is the next one up for them in the draft. Yeah, I really like his patience. He's a very patient and pass pro. He never, he, he rarely throws the first punch. He waits for the defensive lineman to kind of make his move, and then he counters with that. So he's got some some very technical things that are good. He's got a few things, like I said, he needs to work on, I think, to take it to the next level. But uh, Northwestern's done a good job of development there, and uh, I expect them to, to, to improve on last year's season. Well, we will continue to improve here on the block as we continue to develop this show. You at home can help us do so. Like, share, subscribe. Continue to get us out there as we roll the block forward into the 2022 season. Check these two out on Twitter, then head to 247sports.com for all things college football. Gentlemen, it is always fun.